Well, hey there, and welcome to episode number 522 of Six Pixels of Separation, the Miram podcast. My name is Mitch Joel. It's July the 10th, 2016. Let's get on with the show. So who are you and what do you do? My name is Nicholas Boothman, and uh, I write books and give speeches about face-to-face communication that make really complicated concepts sound very simple and very interesting. Nick, I have, there's two sides here. One is we've known each other for like over a decade at this point. Since you were a little boy. (laughs) So I was a little (laughs) tiny chap, yeah, for sure. Um, In fact, interesting story is one of the first times I saw you was my own a desire to figure out how I was going to make this agency. At the time, it was called Twist Image. Now it's called Miram. But to figure out how it was going to work. And I went to one of these big sort of sales events, and you were one of the speakers. And I was fascinated because I had read uh, one of your more popular books, How to Make People Like You in 90 Seconds or Less, and was really taken by the content. And then, sure, we are, sure enough, we fast forward you know, 10 years later, and we, we often get to share the stage. We get to see each other speak. It's a whole other world. It's hilarious to me. It is wonderful. Yeah. So most recently, um, you wrote a book that is in an area that I've been fascinated with almost my entire life being a writer. And I know it's an area that a lot of business leaders and business thinkers often think about, which is, should I, shouldn't I write a book? How do I make a book that sticks? So you wrote a book called How to Write a Sellable Book. (laughs) A saleable book. A saleable book. Yeah. There is a big difference, actually. I have to put it in the book. Sellable means fit for sale. A broken plate is not fit for sale. Um, uh, so it's saleable book. In 10-minute bursts of madness. So, so let's sort of go into the first part, which is I, I feel like writing a book about how to make a book is almost like a very smaller niche compared to the world you've been in because your bestsellers have been convince them in 90 seconds, how to make someone fall in love with you in 90 days, uh, how to live to a hundred. I mean, you, you sort love of in, love in 90 minutes, love in 90 minutes. I mean, you <laughs> tend to sort of be in this almost like life hacking in big, big components of people's lives that they're challenged with. And then what made you go in this somewhat niche direction? I like the idea of life hacking. Two reasons, really. Um, one of them for a company that that um, I'm not, I now um, a, a part owner of a company out of Las Vegas, um, and with, uh, the one of the main goals of that company is to turn people who want to be authorities into authorities. Because as you know very well, um, if you really want to succeed in business, uh, you need to become an authority. You need to you need to have people come to you because of your expertise and your wisdom. That's that's the kind of that's that's one reason. Uh, but that didn't come first. What came first was that I was forever being approached by people because look. You know, I, I'm not famous for being modest, but so I've had uh, three of my books um, have done over two million copies each, and and uh, t- two of them are in 30 languages and once in 25 languages. I've actually done it. You know, I've sold books, and I was not a writer. I had not the clue about writing, and um, so along the way, though, I figured a whole bunch of stuff out, and and I know actually know now. Uh, how to write a saleable book. And it's interesting because when I wrote my love book, How to Make Someone Fall in Love with You in 90 Minutes or Less, we looked at 2,000, all my books are based on modeling excellence. So for that book, we looked at 2,400 couples who'd been together for more than 20 years and were still actively nuts about each other to look for the common threads. And then we looked at people who consistently mess up. And one of the conclusions we came up with, which was blindingly simple, was that falling in love and staying in love have got nothing to do with each other. They're completely separate events. But if you get the elements of staying in love right before you fall in love, then your chances of success go through the roof. Fast forward to a book. Well, it's the same thing. Writing a book and selling a book have got nothing to do with each other. They're completely separate events. But if you get the elements of a saleable book right, 
before you write or at least before you publish your book, your chances of selling a ton of books and becoming um, an authority go through the roof. So in a way, that's what the saleable book is about because people would come to me and say, Nick, I've written a book. It's not selling. What can I do? And I'll say, what's your title? I'll say, that will never sell. Um, who do you, who's your primary audience? No, you're wrong. All these things that people don't that I learned the hard way. Most most people haven't got a clue who they're writing their book for. Okay, so I was going to save this thought for the end of our conversation, where I thought we'd sort of have this big crescendo and go there, but I'm going to throw it and lop it out onto the table now because I think it's an important factor that many people don't get, which is I completely agree that there's a massive chasm between writing and selling a book. There's no doubt. I think where people who want to write a book um, quiver or get a bit uncomfortable or are not sure is that they feel the components of what it takes to sell a book can actually be superficial, somewhat dumbing down of what they're trying to do. How yeah. do you take that? Well, which, which completely proves my point. They haven't got a clue. Okay. No, it's true. Look, uh, well, first, first of all, um, there are this. This book is not for hippies and writers and 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 dreamers. This is a book for business people to write a book to become an authority to package their expertise to gain instant credibility to connect as an expert to open doors whilst they're asleep and build their brand and leave a legacy, etc., etc., etc. It's for those people. However, we, I don't know about you, but but but. The, the majority of – because we now not only have the book, now we're giving workshops all over. I think we've got 12 books for this year all over North America. And people come and they can't believe they come. And they arrive at 5 o'clock on a Friday and they leave with the first draft of their book at 5 o'clock on Sunday. All 10 chapters, all in – all with an emotional opening and emotional closing. Why? Because the thing is about, about writing a book is that whilst, whilst according to the, the Wall Street Journal, 70% of all Americans want to write a book at some time in their life, um, anyone who's tried to write a book, uh, you'll find that they, they either start it uh, and get, get to the end of chapter one, perhaps, and then spend the next 17 months polishing paragraph three, uh, and we've all been there. Oh, it's not quite right yet. And they never get the whole book done. Um, or there are people just do half their book and put it away. It's all finished off on my holidays and they never do. This gets the whole darn thing done really quickly. And it's for non-writers. So, I mean, it's, it's natural for me and others listening to this to be very skeptical of this. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, it's normal. So, one is what... What is it that's happening in that room for people who don't write, don't know how to write? Is it just the sort of blasting down of the ideas and we'll fix it in the editing? Is it is it true that anybody can write, which I very candidly, we've known each other a long time. I just don't believe that's true. Mm. Um, well, actually, um, actually, here's what happens. First of all, they, they have homework. They have to complete some homework before they get there. Um, uh, you'll be amazed uh, how many people I will ask who, who would come to our, our, our advanced workshops and just listen to what it was about. And I would say, okay, what are you writing a book about? And let's say someone said, uh, how to help women with their finances. And I say, well, you do realize that that book is being written right now by 17 people just in Ontario uh, and all that. So I say to them, who is the world's biggest expert on your topic? Uh, they'll either say me, which is just ridiculous, or um, uh, I don't know. Um, who's the biggest expert in Canada? Uh, they might tell me someone. Who's the biggest expert in Ontario? Uh, what's the best book? Uh, in other words, they don't even know what their competition is. Okay, so the part of the homework is they have to they have to go out and do their due diligence. They have to know who's the biggest expert in the world. They have to come up with a fresh approach for it. They have to actually define their topic so that when they actually and the, and there's it's not a lot. The homework actually only takes about uh, three hours. But by the time they get there, they understand that what they're going to be doing is crossing a stream that has eight stepping stones in it. Uh, on the first bank, which is the opening of the book, where they get leverage um, with their readers. Um, because the reader has to like them and trust them and feel safe and love them and comfortable with them. The, f the final bank is the, is the wrap-up, the emotional closing. Where do you go from here? And then the eight stepping stones across the stream. Um, you can, okay, fine. So you're going to teach people how to build kitchen cabinets. 
you're going to have eight steps to do it. What's the first step? Maybe the first step is talking to the family and saying, well, how do you all feel about this? And let's all go out shopping together and look at kitchen cabinets we like. The next one might be, do I get a contractor or not? You know, this sort of thing. I mean, it's, it's, it, you actually break it down into eight logical steps. So on each stepping stone is a whole pile of stuff, steak and sizzle. So we can, and, 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 and on each stepping stone, they have to tell a story. They have to give a step. There has to be an exercise. And it's actually, it become, it's, I know it sounds formulaic, but the, but it, and it is formulaic, except it's written by them. And they write, each chapter is broken up into three 10-minute bursts of writing. And there's a very interesting way that we do it. Um, so let's say that, that let's say they're on chapter three, and let's say it's about uh, well, let's let's say it's about m making people like you. Okay, then what everybody does, we send they all go to market. They get up and they pretend we choose a different marketplace. It might be Marrakesh or it might be St Lawrence Market, and they in groups they bump into each other and say, "How's the book going? What are you writing about next?" And they start talking to each other. Well, you know, I'm up to this now, and I'm going to start doing this. And someone might frowsy. I don't quite get that. Do you understand where I'm going? It's totally. actually amazing. Because you know that the, uh, you know as a, as a very successful speaker and writer, the more you yap about your stuff, the more you think, where did that come from? You it know? crystallizes. It crystallizes it, absolutely. So this process actually works. We've only had one person drop out. And that's because they weren't supposed to be there in the first place. Uh, someone just said, oh, you've got to come and see this. And they had nothing to write about. But we've done it. And then what happens at the end? They have a complete, they've worked like crazy. Uh, and they've also learned like crazy. And at the end, they have this baby. It may not be the most attractive little thing in the world, <laughs> but it's all theirs. And it's their topic and their expertise with a beginning, with chapters, and an end. At that point, they have three options. This is if you come to the weekend. In the book, it's, there's more there, but there's, there's more work involved. But when you leave the workshop, you have three options. Number one, you can take a 60-day workbook with you, which in, day by day tells you what to do, how to end up with a fourth rewrite. Uh, and then to add what I call story speak. I teach them how to do story speak. So, because I, I say, look, you, you, you're writing. There are so many poorly written self help books out there by unattractive people that 99.9 of them never sell. And if the, the, the author says they sell, they're liars because they're, they're not selling. Uh, they know that. Um, but but, but I, 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 say, I, I make the comparison between, you know, I live on a farm, you know that, between my John Deere tractor manual which is a book, and a really cozy, comfy, super self-help book. So you can either write, uh, you know, you can either write a tractor manual, or you can write a book, which is really fun to read, and other people want to read. And so, so I show them how to use story speak, how to tell stories. Most people who want to talk about their own experiences, I say, look, if you've got six stories to tell, one can be about you. Make the others about a couple of people who live in North Africa, a couple of people who live in Australia, a couple of people who live in France. Rename everybody. And so we get that global feel to it. And then so when it's finished, they can either go and start rewriting themselves. The second option, which costs some money, is that they can have uh, two, two one-hour phone calls a week with a professional editor who will read their stuff and say, this is what I want you to write now in the next three days. Or they can just literally hand it in at the door and for quite a lot more money uh, in three months' time, they will, they will have a lot of con a consultation with an editor, but someone will take it away and write it. But the point is, they did write the book themselves in the beginning. They wrote the whole first draft. Okay, so let's, let's go, go back and sort of speak about this more from a philosophical thing about how people listening to this need to think about getting to a book. Um, fully understanding that you got this great service, and I, I know it's great because I know you, and I, I know the quality is one million percent there. So w as you're speaking, I'm thinking one thing. You're going to get to the end of this, and a lot of times, and again, I'm, maybe I'm being a bit of a snooty writer myself, but yeah, a lot of stuff just sucks. You know, you sort of look at it after the work, you know, this person doesn't really know how to write. The stories aren't really all that unique and or compelling it does feel really formulaic and it sort mm -hmm. of leads me to like this. So does the world need more books? Yes. Does the world need more crappy books? Probably not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, okay. Here are some of the criteria they have to consider in their homework. Number one, well, let me tell you a little story. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and you, you probably, you, you must know this is true. It's actually all in the title. 
Uh, there, <laughs> I have to look, when I came up with my first idea for my first book, How to Make People Like You in 90 Seconds or Less, I had met socially um, a Canadian publisher uh, with quite a well-known publishing house. Um, I hadn't written the book. I went to this publisher and I said, um, uh, you know, I made an appointment, went to, went to see her. I said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a book. She said, what's it called? I said, How to Make People Like You in 90 Seconds or Less. She said, can you hang on a second? And she got up, went in the other room, came back about a minute later with a guy and said, this is my acquisitions editor. We'd like to buy the world rights. I said, well, I haven't written it yet. So don't worry about that. We can take care of that. I actually left there with a contract and an advance, all right, just on a title. As it happened, they got a ghostwriter. It was it was such an, an, an embarrassment what the ghostwriter did. In the end, the publisher said, look, I'm really sorry. This is a mess. I'll give you back. Um, uh, the rights, and you can keep the the, um, the the advance. Not long after, so I started working on it myself. But and, but then I ended up in New York with Workman Publishing, which is uh, if, if, I'm sure most people like I had never heard of it, but it does happen to be the dream publisher of any author, if, not, not for the least of which because they've got 28 publicists on staff who full time work on your book forever. Uh, and you know what that means. Um, and so, um, but I, I, I left Workman's office with a six-figure contract, uh, a six-figure check, rather, and, a, and another a contract. Uh, and it, it was the title. I mean, it was all about the title. Listen, and, I, I tell the story when I did the first one, Six Pixels of Separation, that I actually signed with Hachette largest yeah. book publisher in the world. I was on the Grand Central side. There's Grand Central Little Brown. Yeah. Grand Central's bigger than Little Brown. And my editor was the executive vice president, like he ran the imprint. So all the editors filtered into him. And the story goes, according to my literary agent, that when he first pitched it to him, he loved the title Six Pixels Separation so much that he literally had a post-it note on his phone that said Six Pixels. And he would call and harass my agent to harass me to get the book proposal in. Right. And I was like, and it's funny because again, that superficial comment, which, you know, again, is going to be a theme here for sure. You never judge a book by its cover, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, you're always judging a book by its cover. And of the course. title is, people don't understand that the title is so critical. Yeah. And, and, and yours is, yours is a, a specific, a very specific book and it's brilliant. But I will not, I would not let one of my uh, students use that title. <laughs> I'll tell you why. Because a, a, a killer title, let me see if I can find it here to, to read out the elements of a killer title. Well, the first thing is a killer title, um, because Workman Publishing, they've got books like What to Expect When You're Expecting a Thousand Things to See Before You Die. I mean, they've got you know, multi-million sellers. Sure. And, and it, they won't accept a book if it doesn't have a benefit in the title. Hmm. So, uh, so I, uh, I can't find it right now. But it, but but I have the certain criteria for a title. Not only must it have a benefit in it, um, because I, I, as you now know, or you probably always knew, when I ask the, uh, somebody who's let's say writing a book about about helping women's finances, and I say to them, okay, fine. So who is your primary audience? And they'll all say, well, you know, women who dare to blah blah. I say, no, it's not. Your primary audience is book bloggers, book reviewers, television segment producers, magazine segment producers, because if those people don't write about your book, no one's going to know your book even exists. That's who you're writing for. So uh, in the case of, let's say, my book, How to Make People Like You or any of my titles, I have, I would say, at any one time, I have at least one or two articles, big ones, running in major magazines around the world every month. Uh, I've just I've just been in uh, um, Essence magazine. What it was it? It was it was how to make people like you at Christmas. Uh, I was in Woman's World again. I get in that about once a year. How to make people like you uh, in the in, in the uh, how to make people like you and your kids in the March break. They take your title and they bend it. Or, or TV uh, Good Morning America. How to make people like you on Valentine's Day. Or, or they, that's that's what keeps the book. Selling, but look, my last, my last, uh, how to make people like you, the last reprint uh, was 75,000 copies. The last reprint. Hmm. That's unbelievable. Why? Because these titles keep going out there. And, and so that's what I tell people. If you, I mean, your, yours is not a book for the general public. I mean, it's no. a book for specific people. But if you have a book for the general public, then your primary audience, 
And your secondary audience isn't even your reader either. Your secondary audience is the people in the bookstores who have to put the books on the shelves. Because if they don't, if they look at the title and say, you know, blah, 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 they say, I don't know where to put this book, you know, where does it go? So, you know, when I wrote How to Make, How to Connect in Business in 90 Seconds, I said, great, that goes in the business section. These things are so simple. But, you know, I have people coming up to me with titles and, and like, I, I, well, I don't know, well, you might hear this, but I have a guy come up with a weirdest, I tested his title uh, with, with audiences because uh, uh, he refused to change it. And about 30% always said, that's a book for pedophiles, just mm-hmm. because, of the, because of the title. Wow. You know, you know and it, the, so the title is gigantic. So I, we spend a lot of time and a lot of agony going, of course, the majority of people will not get a title in the weekend workshop, or, but it will come to them, and they do get the idea of the incredible importance of having a great title. Yeah, it's funny. I, I, I struggle with writing, getting the writing started until I have the title. To me, the title is always the anchor, and I feel like when I have the title, that's when the floodgates really start opening for me. And I know it's different for everybody, but for me, it's like it's got it's title driven. It's hilarious. It's just the way I am. You no, know, I agree with you. In fact, I call it, uh, I call it a, a book and, and the chapters and a speech as well. Because I encourage people: you want to write a book, go and give a speech on your topic. Yeah. Go because if you it, uh, uh, giving a speech will oblige you to have an opening, a closing, and the equivalent of say three chapters. And I call a speech or a book a shish kebab. It's got a hook, it's got a point, and a whole bunch of steak and sizzle, but the, but the point runs through everything. The point has to run through everything. So when they write a, t- a, ch- a chapter, they're actually writing a shish kebab. What's your hook? What's your point? What's the question that, that, that this chapter will answer? And then we break it down into headings and subheadings. And that's how they spend their 10 minutes writing without stopping. Not allowed to stop. And it doesn't take very long to shove their, their subconscious out of the way. Uh, it's automatic writing. But it doesn't take long to shove their subconscious out of the way so that what comes through? Their voice comes through. And, that, and that's very important too. Yeah. And is, and, I mean, you, so, so break down, there's two other components of what you said earlier that I want you to just define so that people who are listening really understand this and, and even for my own benefit. What is story speak? Story speak is... Uh, uh, so you're writing, you're doing your 10-minute burst for, say, let's say it's a chapter on uh, moving to a new town, uh, public transport, or getting around, okay? So you're writing that. So you'll start writing, well, you, you'll, have, you'll say, well, I'm getting around, fine, so I've got to find out where the shops are, I've got to go to the shops, whatever, there's an emergency, go to hospital, blah, blah, blah. And, and as you go along, you'll say, uh, story here, and then you'll go along, uh, exercise here. And you and that. So when you go back and you write, start writing story speak, it means you put stories in there. So let me tell you, because a well-written self-help book, as you know, is my books are full of stories. So let me tell you a little story about, you know. So instead of instead of talking about um, or to illustrate, you know, uh, finding where the best shopping area is if you move to new town, you know, let me tell you a little story about about uh, Fatima and Salim uh, who arrived in da 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 da. And uh, one day Salim got home from work and, uh, he, and she was looking so flustered and harassed she'd been to the wrong store. And then you go into narrative and dialogue. And it's pretty easy once you get the hang of it. You know, so, so, and, so, and, 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 my, and even though those stories may have all happened to my children or my next door neighbor or me or my wife and they all happened around Bowmanville and Port Hope. By the time they get into the book, they happened in Marblehead, just outside Boston, uh, you know, just at a tourist resort outside Lisbon, you know, the time we were visiting the south of France. Well, you just move them around. It makes the book more interesting. And also it's the, what, you're, what you are doing uh, in, in a not-so-subtle way is you're also encouraging the person who's writing to be more observational about their lives. I think one of the struggles that I meet with when I speak with people who are trying to write books and want coaching for me is they feel like they have nothing original to say. And clearly what you want them to have in the book is original content, not just sort of baking off of what someone else did. And that's exactly where I, where I take them. It's you have to be able to take components of your everyday work and turn that into an observation that you realize, wow, this is a chapter. It's a paragraph. There's a thought here that maybe the greater world has heard, but not in my way or in the in the issues that my clients faced with it. Well, you're absolutely right. You've actually alluded to it earlier on, but you're absolutely right. In fact, the second most important thing after um, a killer title is what's your fresh approach? 
because absolutely guaranteed your book's been written by somebody. Yeah. I mean, maybe not something as special as, specialized as yours, but, but what, I mean, mine, mine had been written by Dale Carnegie. He wrote How to Win Friends and Influence People, and along comes me writing How to Make People Like You in 90 Seconds or Less. So the very first thing was, what is your fresh approach? My fresh approach is that I introduced a time component, all right, and that made all the difference in the world. Um, so that's why I say to people, you've got to find out who is the biggest expert in the world and what the most the best book in the world is. Then you have to come up with a fresh approach because otherwise people are going to go into the bookstore. A, your book's probably not even going to get there. But if it is there, it's going to be sitting right next to, you know, my book, How to Make People Like, is going to be sitting right next to How to Win Friends and Influence People, and and what they mine obviously has a fresh approach. Yeah, and you, you want know. yours to be the one they choose, not the not not the other ones. And oh. and and define this this ten minute burst as well for people who are sort of like, what does that look like? Okay, let's say you were going to write a book about um, about uh, well about me um, uh, using Skype because you know I use it, but I'm you you are you were miles ahead and you were helping me through some stuff earlier. So let's say that we're going to write um, a chapter. Let's say we're going to write a chapter on using Skype. So the first, the first part of the chapter may be uh, how to set up Skype, all right? So the headline would, because for each chapter you break it down into three headlines, and each headline is broken down into three sub-headlines. So let's say the first headline was um, uh, setting up Skype, and then you, you as the expert would come up with three subheadings. One might be, I don't know, making sure the software is installed properly, number two, um, getting the settings correct, uh, three, making sure that your camera and your and your microphone are really great and working properly. Okay, so that is that is that would be one ten minute burst of writing. So after you've gone to the marketplace and met everybody else, and you say, "What are you going to write about now?" Well, right now in my book, I'm going to write about setting up Skype, and I'm going to be doing this, and I'm going to da da. And so, in other words, now you start talking about it. Okay, the seeds are starting to grow a little bit. You're hearing yourself speak. Other people are looking at you, or frowning, or saying, "Well, that's pretty good. I didn't know how to do that myself." Or, or I had a problem once with that, and I had to, went through a whole speech to take somebody, in, and the microphone wasn't working. There's a story for you. Okay, then they sit down, and the clock starts. So in 10 minutes, they have to address the subhead, the, the heading, and all three subheadings in their writing. And the deal is, uh, and by the time they've done it once or twice, in, in fact, we practiced the first, by the time they've done it once or twice, um, the, when, the, when the bell goes, uh, they're either typing or writing longhand, and the pen is not allowed to stop moving. You have to keep moving all the time. If you can't think of anything to say, you say, I can't think of anything to say now, and I still can't think of anything to say, and I'm looking around the room, and everyone's writing, and I'm not. Boom. And suddenly that will get knocked aside, and you'll start writing, and you'll get right to the end. And I tell you something, everybody keeps on writing, even when they get to the 10 minutes, and they go, that wasn't 10 minutes, that was only four minutes. Yeah. yeah. You know, it just kicks. Uh, kick. And then we go to the second subheading. Uh, the second uh, uh, heading and it's three subheadings. We give them, we give them, uh, you know, five or ten minutes to 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 get their wrists back working. Then they stand up and they walk around the room again. They go to market again, so, and they meet other people. So what are you doing this time? Oh well, I'm, you know, I'm going to be doing this, this, this. Then they sit down and they write about it. So they were just talking about it, hmm. and it's actually a really simple technique, and it really works. Okay, now I want to elevate this beyond the sort of mechanics of what you do to get people to write and, and actually look at the marketplace. Um, you know, when you built your success, and it's been an amazing trajectory over many, many years from when you were doing fashion photography, the business was so fundamentally different. Mm. Uh, we're in a world now where there's less and less bookstores, and even the ones that still exist look more like gift stores than bookstores. The book sections are getting smaller and smaller. We people like, I mean, you're definitely in a bigger audience based because it's more sort of motivational and evergreen versus mine, which is more specific. So as you get more specific, there's even less and less space for authors like us in stores. We have a world where self-publishing or publishing uh, is a fair question before you didn't really self-publish unless you couldn't get your book published by a major publisher. Mm -hmm. It's changed, eBooks. Do you still see the value the way it was, I, mean, I definitely don't, but I'm curious your perspective. Well, yeah, I, I, I am now a, a part owner of a company in Las Vegas called Next Century Publishing, and they'll publish your book and they'll get it on all the lists, and they'll, they'll get it everywhere, and they'll get it to all the bloggers when once it's right, and once it's gone through their editors. Excuse me a second. <clears throat> However, um, 
Uh, well, first of all, if only I'd have known now what I knew then, it would have been a heck of a lot easier to do, to do what I'm doing. There are different ways to put your book out, but but this is really a two part a two part process. We have we have a, the, a website which is writeassailablebook.com where you can look at all about the the workshops and 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 the book. But we also have another one called Speak and Get Paid. Um, and speak because because I I recommend when I started teaching people to write originally I said look here's this is the basis this is what you're going to do now I don't want to see you again until you've given three speeches on the on your topic and I don't care who you give it to to your kids teachers to you know the local Boy Scouts or the or the or the line I don't know force a bunch of people together and and make your speech and give your speech out because really I, I the only reason I wrote a book was to to, to help my speaking career go. Mm. And uh, and that's that's really all I can I can talk to. But I can say that I believe. Look, it takes a lot of energy to write a book, and and y- y- you will only have the energy to write a book if you are desperate to get your topic out there. Uh, and you have to find what my passion has always been. And this is in the homework. What so I, I put questions like what's turned you on since you were a kid? What makes you angry in society? What makes you joyful? What makes you cry with joy? For me, it was always the same thing. I've always been passionate about human potential, uh, and I'll do anything for people with potential. I've also been been beyond angered by people who say to people with potential, you'll never be any good at this. I don't know why you bother doing this. You're just a waste of time. I will gladly strangle them. Um, and so that, that's the energy that drove me to do this. So once I do it, I start like at this, just this morning. I'm, I'm doing three gigs in one day in Europe uh, in, in about f- four weeks, and, um, uh, which you know is very <laughs> dodgy getting from place to place. But, uh, but the, you know, they've just ordered a, a few thousand copies of my book. And so I sell books. Like every time I do a gig, people buy books. As for people who are starting to write books now, well, I suggest they start speaking. Uh, I suggest they do a really killer book. I suggest that they get in touch with all the book bloggers. If they're lucky enough in their lives, they'll get to do a podcast with somebody like you. Um, uh, You know, uh, that's the new way of promoting books. But it works. If your book is good, if if it has has, um, uh, a, a, a killer title, uh, with a benefit, people will want to interview you, and then you have to. Ma- and then, if you go through Next Century Publishing, um, and f- for almost nothing, they'll 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 uh, they'll print your book, uh, and they'll and they'll put it on their on their list, and it'll be in Ingram's, the distributor. It'll be on Amazon. Uh, it'll be everywhere. So then, it, look, then it's you can't just go back to bed. Then then you have to start making lots of noise and getting people to review your book and buy your book. But if you care, that's why you have to have energy to care about your topic. But go back to the, my thought about the industry. I mean, the industry still has changed so much. It totally changed. Uh, it, it was changing. Um, it was changing when I when I wrote how to make people like you. Um, in fact, um, I I actually did go down to New York to meet my. I wanted an agent back then, um, and I wanted uh, I wanted the perfect agent for the kind of stuff I was writing. Um, I've I found a way for that to happen, um, but I went and I and I said, look, there's only. She was right in Manhattan, and I said, you know, the only way I'm going to sign with you um, is that if um, if I meet you and look you in the eye. She said, oh, we don't do that in this business, and uh, we no, nobody does that. So, but but in the end, she ins- I insisted, and she said, okay, fine. So I drove down to New York, right on 33rd at, at Fifth. I went into her, met her, and um, and whilst I was there. Um, People were attempting to drop off manuscripts because today most good agents uh, don't accept manuscripts. Uh, most big publishing houses don't accept manuscripts either, unsolicited manuscripts. And whilst I was at her office, a guy came. He'd come up from, from Texas or somewhere. He had cowboy boots on, shorts. He had a guitar around his neck and a, a, some kind of weird hat. And he, thought if, and he had his manuscript under his arm and he thought... He, he was sure if he went to New York and sang a song and got the attention of an agent, and she just said, "No, don't. I'm not. T- don't put it in my hand. I'm not touching it." You know. So that it was changing back then. Agents and uh, a hard, a good agents. Look, plenty of people out there say, "Oh, we'll make your book happen for you. Pay me some money." Um, but the, the 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 traditional route um, in self help um, has gone. In fiction, it's slightly different. Uh, but fiction's not my not my world. Um, so, but but the, but today it's. It's a, a click away. If you want to write a killer book 
and get it out there and you've got to save up a few pennies um buy my book my book will get you from the beginning to the end and you'll know if you can write a book or not darn it the thing i don't even know what it costs it doesn't cost very much 10 bucks or something um and uh but then from there it shows you where to take your book to get it published then you got it out there then you start sending it to people then maybe you want to hire a publicist uh, there are plenty of freelance publicists out there with good contacts then maybe you want to get on good morning america on breakfast television you know i went on breakfast television before i'd written how to make people like you and said look i will go into the, into school any school that can get together a group of kids who are going to be looking for jobs i will go and speak for free to those kids this was in mm, 2000 uh, or 1999, and, the, and, and, and within three days, they had 1,400 kids in nine schools, and I went and spoke to them. You know, you've got to, you've got to, but it, I went and spoke because I was passionate. I, I was passionate about these kids getting jobs, you know. Think about the market today um, and then remove, you know, your books because they're great examples of what you, you preach and what you want people to do. Can you give me an example of a book in market, one that we might know that, that to you sort of fits the archetype of what, you want people to think about if they're going to start writing a book. Is there one that sort of comes mind? Again, not not yours, but no, so, something new, newish that is is there where you're like, this person really nailed sort of my system or how I think about it, with maybe without even knowing it. You know what? I can't actually because I don't read very much. Um, and, <laughs> We're and, all uh, like that. Eh? It's, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't I've listen got, to podcasts. I just make them. <laughs> well, you know, I've got shelves of books here that people insist on sending me. Uh, and uh, I, I, well, but first of all, a, but there's nothing sort of in the past couple of years that really sort of clicked where you're like, I don't know if this person has seen my work or not, but man, they really that's really what I'm talking about here. Um, <sighs> no, but you know what? The next time someone asks me that question, I will have an answer to it. <laughs> well, what's, no, really, well, what's I'm, interesting, I'm though, well, I should have an answer to that question. Well, what I'm thinking is it's interesting because that really says something also, which is there's an opportunity here. Because uh, I think it would be obvious. Because in my brain, I'm also sort of trying to think. I'm mean, even looking at my bookshelf, going like, "What's one that I think really sort of fits the the cake?" And I'm not sure. I I sort of see it imminently either. But it, so I'm, I, well, I'm sure. I, I haven't read it, but I would have to think the wealthy barber exactly um, is, uh, must do that. Because it's got right. just the title itself is uh, you know is killer. And I know he went from he wasn't a writer, from what I understand. And um, it's just rich it's just, dad, poor dad. Exactly, rich dad, poor dad. Any of those? It's all the title. You remember the title? Um, uh, yeah, rich dad, poor dad. Uh, uh, I mean, what to expect when you're expecting is different. I mean, I can name any of the yeah. titles from. There's a whole like, chicken soup for the soul and all those. <laughs> well, but but again, they they are you know fairly. God bless them. I mean, they're, they're interesting books, but they're. That it's just a great title. It's just yeah. a phenomenal brand. So the, the other you, we talked earlier about um, competitive books and competitive titles. And when it was the early days for me, and I was asked by my literary agent, let's put together a book proposal, and they gave me the format for it, and I went through it, and I thought that, you know, again, I think book proposals is also one of the most underutilized skill uh, 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 underutilized tools that an author can use to really write a great book. I think doing that hard work of like who my mm. audience is, who am I, what's my platform, uh, what are the chapters, what is each chapter going to have, a sample chapter. Why am chapter. I different? Yeah. yeah, I mean, and so, but that was the part that really got me and it gets me every time. And I'll, I'll explain to you why. When you talk about the competitive books, so it's fascinating to me and I was really taken aback when you said this. You said, you know, how to make people like you in 90 seconds or less. So if Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence, people i did a switch on it i put a time component in it and i thought i stopped myself because i was like wow it's almost like nothing to do that but it's everything and it made the world of difference and it's stunning because it seems and feels so simplistic and yet it had a profound effect to this day where again millions upon millions of books have been sold with that my issue and i know other authors for sure who are in the same boat or who come to me they get stuck at the competitive books because once they start looking analyzing they get deflated even if they think they have their own spin even if they think they put a constraint on it like time or whatever they're, they still look at it and go like i mean i have countless stories nick of very very smart people who should have written books who didn't write books whose only answer to me is everybody's written a book 
Well, yes. <laughs> what what, what more, a contradiction more, in terms. Well, more, you have more room for you and I. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I'm saying that that, that yeah. for me, it it, it 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 is it was it was hard to look at the competitive landscape and define how they are competitive to what I was trying to do, and then to get the energy after that. I mean, it 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 was challenging. I'm being really candid about it. That was yeah. the one part of the book puzzle where I was like, like man, like there's some good books on this topic out there. Yeah. Yeah, that's why you you have you have to find a fresh approach. You have to find a fresh approach, and you have to have a narrow market, really. Even if you're writing a, um, you know, a book like I mean, for this is for everybody, you have to, well, you have to basically write for eight year olds in what I do, um, uh, and I don't mean that badly, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, sure. Um, how do how do you what do you recommend to people to overcome that moment? I'm not sure I understand you completely. So tell me so, again. So moment. in the book proposal, when I'm looking at the competitive landscape, typically what I'll do is I'll put the author's name, the title out. If I haven't read the book, I'll look at the book, and then I write a little blurb. This book is about X, Y, and Z. Mm. When I'm done that component of it, out of all the excitement of building proposals, this is going to be great. My chapter is me, my platform. I'm all excited. But that when, I, when you work on that component, it can be deflating. And I, oftentimes, I have a hard time getting the enthusiasm back up to get to the writing part and getting excited about it because I feel like this is a very cluttered landscape. Yeah, so, well, so my question is, how, what, what tips do you give people like me or others who are hearing this and going, I know exactly what he's saying to get beyond that? Just forget that now and start writing it. Yeah, nice well, say, well, well I mean, that's exactly my point of the book. You know, I do have a chapter on, on, on the value of a book proposal, and it's valuable to some people. I mean, there are, we, you know, we have rational people and we have more emotional people writing books. But, I mean, the whole point of my book is that, is that that if you can get your book out of you i mean it's these courses these weekend courses it's actually only about 15 hours of writing but in 15 hours of writing you've gone from the beginning to the end or, or you know to, to to use an illustration it's like i live on a farm at christmas we go into the forest we bring the christmas tree in we cut the christmas tree down we bring it in we stick it in a pot boing there is the whole darn christmas tree now all we got to do is decorate it hmm. okay and so that's the whole point of this book, that people do get bogged down. People start looking, they get scratching their heads, they go too deep. If you're with a group of people, and in a very short time, you write your whole book from beginning to end, the problem that you're talking about will not exist. As long as you've done your homework, you've come up with a more or less killer title. Your killer title will probably leap out at you whilst you're writing. You'll, you'll write it down without realizing it, and someone will spot it. The whole point of this is that people get lost and bogged down. Everybody that, everybody that comes to my course, just about, not everybody, 70% of them have taken writing courses elsewhere and paid a fortune. I can't believe how much yeah. some of these courses cost. Some of them have paid over 60,000 bucks, quite a few of them, and, and, and got nothing for it. At least they do this. They're forced. They they talk to other people. They write. There's no there's no time to get bogged down. So at least they've got the entire thing down there. Then they can go back and story speak it and, and read it through themselves and think, wow, you know what? Maybe I should give it this slightly different angle. They start to they start to say things like, wow, did I write that? You know. Uh, so I think that's that's my answer to your question. That that the that the getting discouraged and getting bogged down is only because you've got time to get bogged down. You've got no time for anything. Time. Yeah, hit the timer and get going. I, I get asked this question a lot. I'm curious your take on it. So you have this great packaging. You, you've got this title. You've got the content. You follow the system. You've done it successfully. Others have too. People then ask me this. What should I be investing on marketing of it? And again, if you've got the title, you've got the look at marketing is a huge component of it. And I'm always, as a, a guy who runs a marketing agency, it's a tough question to answer because a lot of people are moving into the whole got to mortgage the home type of thing because they're really banking on this. And I get a bit uncomfortable. But what's your answer back? Because the, the to, to I mean, listen, my marketing is my, my, my bread and butter. You have to market a book. Right? It's a, it's, and it, it's not cheap. Well, I, uh, my answer is really simple, and you don't have to market a book. Mm. Um, my my answer is very simple, and it's why Workman are the, are the the biggest privately owned publishing company in America. They don't market books; they use publicists. Hire a publicist. Hire a publicist. I don't care what you do, even if you're open in a candy store or a bakery. Hire a publicist. A publicist with contact. The publicist will get you on the TV. They'll get you in the in the papers. That's a publicist's job is to get you get you publicity. You can either market, advertise, or publicize. I'm I'm a believer that that it it sure as heck has worked for me, and it still is doing. 
Um, we're just about to start. With the, there's been nothing done yet for how to write a saleable book, and it's about to start. I've just been talking with my publicist uh, um, in the last couple of days. She just got a copy of the book, and it's going to be publicity. She's going to say such and such wants to interview you, this podcast, this but blog Nick, wants to talk the, to you. This is fascinating to me because I can't tell you how many times, and I'm talking about major authors, either on major publishing houses or people who have resources who say the publicist like has completely let them down, nothing came through, they've entrusted mm -hmm. them, they gave them money, and the, I'm not talking about swindlers, I'm talking about big publishing houses mm -hmm. with teams, I'm talking about individuals who have reputations for X and X best-selling novels, and when it comes to them, there's nothing. Now, What's, what I think you're going to say is, well, that's because they don't have the title or the right thing for the publicist to push. But in, in these instances, a lot of times these are books that have gone on to done, do quite well, but the publicist didn't add much value. And I see that a lot. Well, well, I, I agree. I, in fact, the, um, Next Century Publishing, just ha against my wishes, hired a publicist. I said, this person, well, look, if a publicist doesn't have contacts and charisma, uh, you know, and energy, then not, I said, no, now, that, now they're getting rid of that person right now. Boy, I hope no one's listening to this. You better check that out. Uh, and and uh, and they've asked me to, to to find a publicist. Look, they're a crappy publicist. A publicist can only work with what they got. And if it's not a provocative title, again, what can I say? How to make people like you? It, I I got a full page in the New York Times. I got a half a page in the Houston Chronicle. It's simple. With, with, with that title, they sent me onto the streets. As they said, okay, fine, go make people like you. And have a reporter followed me and a photographer squirreled away somewhere. Go and make those people like you. First one, it's on my site. You can read it. The first one with the Houston Chronicle was three bike couriers having lunch. Go and make them like you. So I went, over. oh, well, that was obviously easy. There's two cops. Go and make them like you. The woman came running out of it. Go and make them like you. So what happens next? I get half a page in the Houston Chronicle. And then, so what happens then? Uh, my publicist gets, I just got a phone call from... Uh, from uh, from Nebraska, from 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 uh, 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 I got the capital of Nebraska, and they said it might it might be it might work in Houston, but it'll never work here, right? <laughs> so they took me there. Challenge and then in the accepted. End, yeah. You get the idea. And in, in 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 sorry, I said challenge accepted, right? It's like <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I didn't want to do it. I I said no, that's not what the book's about. But it was. And in the end, the they said. The New York Times wants you, John Turney, who was a columnist, he wasn't just a reporter, wants you. And I got, it's on, you can, it's on my website, uh, a full page in the New York Times. Mm. And so, what's more, and what's more, the next morning, they, this was in, in 2000, uh, the, the, ne uh, the next morning, it was uh, 2000, 2001, next morning, they said um, uh, 20. Uh, not 2020, what, what, the ABC, whatever show was, um, they want to do a whole special on your book. Uh, four days later, it was 9-11. Hmm. So it never happened. So last question for you, it, and uh, it's funny because you read people's stories and you see them online and it's always the sort of best story arc and it is the sort of story speak, as you would call it, that, that makes it really resonate. Along the way, it's not always as simple as it seems. And so you've had tremendous success in getting books to be published. You have tremendous success now in helping other people publish their books. But if you could really go back, would you do anything differently? Like what, was there one or two things where you're like, oof, that was the thing I should have. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know, Mitch. You know, I mean, I wrote the book to help my speaking career. I mean, that's I, that's why I wrote it. I didn't I didn't write it to be an author. I just figured my speaking career was going nowhere. Maybe if I write a bestseller with a killer title, my speaking career will pick up. So that's why I wrote it, and it worked. Um, what would I do differently? Um, no, I don't think I'd do anything differently. I've learned as I've gone along. Um, um, uh, I know I should have an answer for this. I really don't have an answer for it. I, I, I'm very happy. Your life is perfection, Nick. That's no, the answer. No, 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 I, no, no, no. I, I'm, I'm pretty lazy, and I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't spend much of my life looking over my shoulder. To tell you the truth, that's probably why. Um, but it, it, it I, I, I got an amazing, an amazing agent, um, and an, an amazing publishing house. And, and, you know, Peter Workman, who's no longer with us, was an amazing guy. His, his motto was, no book before it's time. And I think that was probably some of the best advice I got. Even if you think your book's done, it's got to be around for the next 100 years. <clears throat> All my books will be around for the next 100 years. Because they're, but the Workman, 
they, when I published my first self-published book and ended up going to see Workman, Peter Workman looked through it and he said, uh, he started flicking through the book. He said, what's that got to do with making people like you? I said, well, nothing actually, because basically the book was just cobbled together from my speeches. And he goes a few more pages. What's that got to do? I said, uh, I'm not really nothing. And then a few more, he said, I said, that does. That bit does. In the end, he says, great. All we've got to do now is turn three paragraphs into a 180-page book. Mm. <laughs> Go off and write it, you know. So, um, but it, your book has to be, it has to be excellent. Uh, excellent. Uh, I, there's no way I, was, I wanted to be, uh, write a great book in Toron for Toronto or for Canada. I wanted it to be global, absolutely global. And that's what's happened. Uh, so you, that's your competition. That's your market. Amazing. And it's as easy. It's, a, it's actually easier to write the best book in the world than a, than a mediocre book. <laughs> And Nick, I can't thank you enough for your time. Let people know where they can connect to some of the stuff we talked about here online. Where, where can they best reach you? My website is just my name dot com, dot com, and that would be uh, wonderful. As as you once pointed out brilliantly at a speech, uh, your your business card is Google. Exactly. <laughs> just go and type my name in there. Uh, if you the the saleable book workshops are are uh, are all over North America. We have quite a few in Toronto. They are incredibly inexpensive for what you get, um, uh, and the speaking ones and everything. Yeah, and uh, you know I have on my website something called Boost. It's over a hundred free tips on on how to make your communicating and connecting.